Good afternoon. It is a uh, special joy to welcome you here today. The highest honor that the law school can award to a faculty member is a chair. The chair that we will award today is a very special chair, and that's appropriate because it's for a very special person. As we gather to honor Gabriella Bloom on her appointment to the Rita E. Hauser Professorship of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, we will be marking this occasion of honoring her by making her sing for her supper. <laughs> Gabby will deliver a talk entitled The Fog of Victory. I'm pleased to extend a special welcome to members of Gabby's family who are here today. Her mother, Ruth Cartoon Bloom, who is a professor of Hebrew literature at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and at the Ben-Gurion University in Negev, and quite a distinguished scholar of literary studies. Uh, and uh, actually, maybe that's where Gabby got a little bit of it. I don't know. And Gabby's sister, Hilit Bloom, who is an author and a poet and actually an acknowledged editor of some of Gabby's work. We're very, very delighted that you're here for this occasion. I'd also like to say something about this chair. It's named for an accomplished, indeed an extraordinary alum, one of our most visionary, one of our most uh, uh, supportive graduates, Rita Hauser, graduate in 1958, has reached the pinnacle of accomplishment in international law. She is an advisor to multiple presidents of the United States, she is an advisor to presidents of Harvard. I don't know if that's in the same class or not. <laughs> Rita Hauser has served on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board and was appointed by President Barack Obama in 1991. This is the board that acts as an independent source of advice on effectiveness with which the US intelligence community is meeting the nation's intelligence needs. She also served on that same board during the administration of President Bush between 2001, 2004. And Rita's leadership in that domain and in domains that she is less visible uh, in uh, is uh, really extraordinary. And I just have to pause for a moment and note, she was recommended by a dean to be a law clerk at the United States Supreme Court after she graduated from law school. Uh, and the dean wrote a letter saying, I know it's rather unusual to be recommending someone who is a woman. Um, and she did not get the clerkship. But the recommendation went on to say this is a person of extraordinary knowledge and expertise in comparative law and how the world has changed, that her chair is now going to be held um, by uh, a woman worthy of the chair. Rita and her husband, Gustav Hauser, met here at Harvard Law School. They uh, have been incredibly generous uh, in supporting uh, many activities at Harvard, including the building around the corner um, where somebody named Gabby Blum has an office. Uh, it's Hauser all the time, I think, for Gabby Blum. Um, but quite seriously, uh, Gustav Hauser himself is a very uh, visionary person who helped to create the cable industry. Um, and his commitment to using New technology to advance education is something that has inspired all of us. Rita uh, plays a role as the president of the Hauser Foundation, and she also received a medal uh, at Harvard commencement that said, caring deeply about education, the world of nonprofits, and Harvard University, you are a dynamic inspiration to us all, conscious of the need to challenge and lead. So I think you can see why we think that this chair is so distinctly appropriate for Gabriella Bloom. Gabby Bloom's commitment to human rights and the pursuit of peace, peace and to humanitarian law and the law of war is matched perfectly, again, in the title for the chair. Uh, it is a chair that is committed to both human rights and humanitarian law, which I have to say I did not know until about 10 years ago is not humanitarian in the sense of being a philanthropist. It is uh, uh, the very, very significant body of law dealing with the laws of war. And uh, Gabby Blum is herself um, someone who has spent her professional life thinking about seemingly intractable international conflicts and war. She's a path-breaking scholar 
She's a superb and inspiring teacher, maybe a little bit terrifying to some people. She's an outstanding contributor to public debate. She is gutsy. She is rigorous. She is generous. She has been an invaluable colleague here since 2005 when she joined the faculty as learned hand visiting assistant professor of law. And she has wowed us ever since with her work as an educator, as a researcher, uh, as an academic in the fields of conflict management, counterterrorism operations, law of armed conflict, negotiation, public international law. This past fall, she helped to launch the new Harvard Law School Brookings Project on Law and Security, and she currently serves with Jack Goldsmith as a co-director of that program. And that's emblematic of her leadership. This is an initiative that seeks to bridge theory and practice and engage students in uh, direct work that makes a difference in the world. The project had an inaugural conference, which was called Law, Security, and Liberty post 9-11. And this was all the workings of Gabby Bloom and Jack Goldsmith. This conference was not just a very fascinating and interesting event that helped to inaugurate our new conference spaces. It featured a major address by a top White House counterterrorism advisor, John Brennan, made the front page of the New York Times. And that is the uh, standard to which this project has continued to adhere. I heard only today about how work of the project is influencing the work in the Pentagon. I also want to note that um, Gabby's work uh, in the field um, has included scholarship at the highest level. With our own Phil Hyman, her bo the book they wrote, Laws, Outlaws, and Terrorists, Lessons from the War on Terrorism, rejects the argument that traditional American values embodied in domestic and international law can be ignored in any sustainable effort to keep the United States safe for terrorism. And this book received uh, the 2010 Chicago-Kent College of Law Roy C. Palmer Civil Liberties Prize. Her book, The Islands of Agreement, Managing Enduring Armed Rivalries, published by Harvard University Press, makes the bold argument that even in the most intractable context, there can be islands of agreement. The very concept, I think, has opened up new avenues of thinking and hope in the midst of um, very, very difficult circumstances. Her works, including cluster munitions, explosive remnants of war, when not to negotiate, the dispensable lives of soldiers, the laws of war and the lesser evil, the role of the client, the president's role in government lawyering. Each of these is pressing beyond the limits of the conventional understanding, opening up new debate, recasting the issues. Indeed, I'd just like to note the dispensable lives of soldiers. Gabby, for a while, was walking around in halls. I'm not sure why soldiers' lives should be any less valuable than anyone else's. And people said, but you know, law of war, and they already, assumption of risk, and everything like that. And she says, no, I'm not sure why. And uh, this is now, I think, really turned the field upside down in a very, very good way. Gabby's uh, degrees uh, include economics, uh, law, Tel Aviv University. Her work at the Israel Defense Forces uh, led her to serve as a senior legal advisor in the International Law Department of the Military Advocate General's Corps. It also led her to be involved in the Israeli-Arab peace negotiations. It also led her to be involved in Israeli strategic cooperation with foreign forces and administration of Palestinian occupied territories. And it also has led her to be a trusted advisor uh, to that government and to other governments ever since. When she completed her work here, studying with uh, several members of this faculty and uh, helping uh, them with their own work as well as they helping uh, her with hers, um, she returned to the Israel Defense Forces to lead the counterterrorism desk. She went on to serve as a strategic advisor of the Prime Minister's Office and the National Security Council. Um, and we actually feel this is one of the very few contests in which we have succeeded in besting the Israeli Defense Force. <laughs> we are incredibly uh, proud and honored to have Gabriella Bloom as our colleague. And now we look forward to hearing the fog of victory.
Thank you, Martha, for this uh, extremely generous introduction. So it's my turn to say a few things about Martha. Uh, what most characterizes Martha's work is uh, what I can only call heart. Her heart informs both the variety and the depth of her interests. Few legal scholars have dared to take on the plethora of subjects that Martha has, from peace and justice to feminism, uh, privacy, education, the internet, and just about everything else. Um, and fewer still have invested so much of their soul to such a degree in an intellectually engrossing work. Uh, thank you, Martha, for inspiring me, for your enduring faith in me, and for your friendship in both hard times and good. Uh, Rita Hauser, um, a lawyer, scholar, philanthropist, and champion of the arts. Uh, Rita Hauser is that rare bird, someone who's committed to causes, not parties. She served as the US representative to the Human Rights Commission, worked to further peace between Israelis and Palestinians, and now heads the International Peace Institute next to the United Nations. But she also serves on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board and is widely considered a leading expert on national security. I want to thank Rita and Gus for doing so much to support Harvard Law School, including in dedicating this chair to international human rights and humanitarian law, which I now proudly proud and honored to hold. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming, and especially uh, my mom, Ruth, for flying all the way from Tel Aviv to witness what she undoubtedly considers a miracle, um, <laughs> her rowdy daughter growing up to be a Harvard professor, uh, a remarkable and prolific scholar of Hebrew literature, my mother's first and foremost passion has always been for teaching. Uh, she taught me to love and cherish teaching as a calling and to appreciate the academic enterprise as a humanist creation in progress to which every generation contributes. Um, thank you. <laughs> I also want to thank my sister Hilit for coming to hold my hand. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my father, Amos, uh, was extremely proud when I joined HLS. He died six months after I started my tenure position here. Um, I miss him terribly and wish so much that he could have been here today with me. Before plunging into my topic, the fog of victory, I want to start out with the question, why war? And why war, I mean, is an academic topic. A few months ago, my friend and colleague from Georgetown Law School, David Luban, who has for many years been preoccupied with the ethics of war, asked me how I felt about working on violence and war. He did this with this kind of timidity that you feel in gentle people broaching the very private subject uh, of their life and their work. David said he sometimes feared that this preoccupation with violence and death was ultimately bad for his soul. It dawned on me that by that time I have been working for 17 years as a practitioner and as a student of the law and morality of war, that my working life was engrossed with questions of killing, destruction, occupation, and anything that explodes. Like Rita Hauser, I was also involved and interested in conflict management and the possibilities of promoting peace. But in one way or another, conflict was always there, a palpable presence. Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker, in his recently published wide-ranging history of violence, the better, better angels of our time, assures us that violence is on the decline in the world, that war is a dying business, at least for the West. Human nature has evolved, he argues, through technology, interdependence, and not least reason, to turn away from violence. Had Pinker met with Sigmund Freud, they would have had an interesting chat. For in Freud's correspondence with Albert Einstein, a correspondence that bears the title, Why War? Freud disappointed his hopeful interlocutor in his wry response, there is no likelihood of our being able to suppress humanity's aggressive tendencies. Whether human nature will ultimately succeed in eradicating violence, I cannot predict. Certainly, we in the West have been growing increasingly averse to the idea of war, often resisting even the explicit term we opt instead for the more diluted, downsized terms, operations, campaigns, or hostilities. At the end of World War II, war ministries had changed their names to the friendlier term, defense ministries. 
But for all our aversion as we sit here today, there are 45 conflicts around the world, including civil wars, transnational armed violence, humanitarian interventions, rebellions, insurrections, terrorism, and insurgency. So whether we like it or not, war is still here and it still matters. It's also the ultimate human drama. It exposes our raw nerves, calls on our most primal nature, and amplifies the entire range of human emotions. Violence, heroism, love, cruelty, sacrifice. Beyond the lives they immediately take or maim, and whether or not they happen on our soil, wars affect our politics, our economies, the way we travel and communicate, the way we think about identity, national or private, our innermost selves, our ethical selves, everything that makes up culture. To borrow a Shakespearean phrase, violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. Where I come from, war matters in the most immediate way. And as David Lubin's question reminded me, all of us are affected in our work to one degree or another by our own biographies. The words anger, rage, hate, revenge, war, all distinctly illiberal and unmodern, are all in common currency in my home region. In Israel, we say them out loud, in public, in conversation, without qualms. They cover miles in newspaper ink, travel our roads on bumper stickers, adorn the walls with graffiti, and generally inhabit almost every corner of our public space. And thinly veiled or not, they make the stuff of public policy. In fact, hatred, revenge, anger, and fear are what politicians count on to be elected and reelected. Correspondingly, war in our region is a given. It is an accepted, expected, respected, very ancient mode of behavior. A case regularly taught in contracts classes in Israeli law school uh, tells of a businessman who sued a fellow businessman over a contract that was not fulfilled due to the outbreak of the 1973 Yom Kippur War. The defendant argued frustration. The court found in favor of the claimant stating that war in Israel was a sufficiently common phenomenon that one must account for in contingency clauses. Now, given that the Israeli intelligence agencies failed to foresee the Yom Kippur War in what is widely considered the greatest Israeli intelligence failure, I'm not sure why Mr. Katz should have foreseen it, but that's what the court ordered. This is not to say that war happens every day, but the Damocles sword of its eruption in one form or another hangs over our lives and informs much of what we feel about life in general. Organized combat tries our values to the last grain. Is there anything in the world worth killing for, dying for? What are those things and who are those people for whom or against whom one pulls a trigger presses the button of a rocket launcher, stands in the turret of a tank. For whom would you walk into a house in which enemy combatants might be hiding? How much are you willing to risk yourself for people you don't know? How much are you allowed to prefer your own lives, life over theirs? War is also the moment of truth for law. It is simultaneously the time in which law is most urgently required to keep us from reverting to an uninhibited savagery, but also the time when our instinct to resist any rules that curb our autonomy is most fiercely awakened. If there are things worth dying and killing for, can the Geneva Conventions really stand in the way? It is these strange juxt juxtapositions, war's ugliness and ubiquity, its desperate need for rules and defiance of them, its way of constantly dragging down our better angels that brought me to study war. As a lawyer, studying war means imagining a range of rules by which war may be checked and regulated, at least to some degree. To do that, one first needs to understand what war is about, why states or groups or individuals engage in war, and in the most mundane, simplistic sense, they go to war to win, or at least to avoid losing. They embark on war to gain victory and avoid defeat. As Sir Winston Churchill once remarked, the problems of victory are more agreeable than those of defeat, but they are no less difficult. And the first problem with victory is its very definition. For all the abundant scholarship and commentary on the challenges of the modern battlefield, there has been little systematic treatment of the concept of victory, and almost none at all among legal scholars. 
But without understanding what victory means today, or to borrow from Jim Whitman, without asking how do you know who won or what do you win by winning, we cannot hope even to approach a workable and meaningful doctrine for regulating war. So in the next half hour, I wish to address these questions. What does victory look today? What does it take to achieve it? And what do you gain by it? Do we have a final moment, a point of ending, that brings us back from war to peace? Can we even have such a decisive moment, given why we fight modern wars, the nature of our enemies, and the rules that govern us? And if no such moment exists, what does it mean to be at war or live in peace? My starting point is that victory today is much harder to see and much more costly to gain. What you win by winning is far less tangible and lucrative for yourself than ever before. And increasingly, it can no longer be articulated solely in terms of national interest, but must also consider the human security of individuals at home and in targeted territories. It begs proof that life after the war is better than life before the war for nearly everyone. A strong force driving this development is the human rights revolution. International law and international morality have made wars today, at least in aspiration, more difficult to prosecute and more expensive to win, changing the prospect of victory forever. I do not mean this as a normative argument or as an invitation to reevaluate the so-called humanization of war. Undoubtedly, the rise of human rights has changed the world we live in far beyond the context of war, and war has changed for reasons other than human rights as well. My aim here is only to flesh out how human rights and humanitarian norms have affected political violence and what victory can mean today. So first, what is the human rights revolution? To the extent there is a Western liberal religion, it is human rights. International human rights in their modern incarnation as they emerge from the second half of the 20th century have had profound effects on how we fight wars. Sovereignty and nationality began to lose their preeminence as the organizing principles of international law. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights recognized the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. Commensurate with liberal ideals, human rights law sought to place the individual as a human being rather than as a subject of his state at the center of international concern. The status of individuals rose as the status of states declined. New treaties governing the laws of war, now paradoxically renamed international humanitarian law, added to the array of protections of those harmed by war and placed further limits on the means and methods of warfare. If in earlier times reciprocity was the primary mechanism of ensuring compliance with the laws of war, as the individual rose in status, his rights and protections could no longer be dependent on his government's willingness to abide by the law. Reciprocity was thus jettisoned as a condition for compliance, and belligerent reprisals were almost entirely outlawed. A party in war cannot today harm prisoners of war or target civilians or damage cultural property, even if its enemy engages in all these practices. Nationality and geography have come under the growing shadow of universal cosmopolitanism. Under the international rules on state responsibility, all countries in the world are injured parties in cases of grave human rights violations. Human rights have turned into a common public good. The spread of democracy after the end of the Cold War, coupled with drastically increasing accessibility and availability of media, further contributed to the growth of what Charles Taylor has termed universal benevolence. Universal benevolence was not limited to what hard law demanded, but transcended into social norms and expectations about caring for others. It was in this political climate that the regulation of warfare was further enhanced through the revival and expansion of the project of international criminal law. Largely dormant after its early display at Nuremberg, international criminal law in the 1990s re-emerged as a manifestation of the rise of the individual at the expense of the state. It was now individuals, not states, who would benefit from rights, and individuals, not states, who would be punished for violations of the rights of others. With the exercise of universal jurisdiction by Belgium, Germany, Spain, and the UK, and the establishment of dedicated ad hoc tribunals 
and ultimately the International Criminal Court, humanitarian norms have become universalized. Any war crime against any victim anywhere around the globe was now a crime against humanity itself. The human rights revolution of recent decades did not abolish war, but it did result in the dramatic transformation of what was allowed in or by war as a matter of both law and politics. At least for liberal democracies, the phenomena endemic to previous wars, mass civilian casualties, torture, conflict-induced famine, collective punishments and reprisals, now had to be avoided, justified, apologized for, and accounted for. Just as Augustine had to come up with the just war doctrine that would justify the participation of Christians as soldiers in the forces of the Roman Empire, so that our modern code of human rights becomes at once a legitimating and a limiting force in the context of which war takes place. A 2011 US Army document on the profession of arms instructs soldiers as follows. The United States' right to political autonomy is the moral basis for the Army's ethic. The Army fights to protect rights and thus must seek to not violate rights in the process. The Army's use of lethal force is directed towards a relevant good. This moral purpose of the Army provides soldiers with justification and aids in their ability to make meaning out of their actions. Making rights the meaning of soldiers' actions turns human rights into a limit on war, but also the rationale for it. Rights thus become a definitive measure of victory, even as they place limitations on how to achieve it. In what follows, I would like to consider in greater detail six consequences of the human rights revolution for victory in current and future wars. These are what victory can mean today, how we fight to achieve it, the shift from combat to policing, the unintended consequences of raising the bar for victory, the idiosyncrasies of our existing legal doctrines, and finally, the significance of the narrative of victory. So first, what can victory mean today, or what can we win by winning? In classical antiquity, victory was often measured in its ability to bring about a lasting change. Thucydides, for instance, used the term victory to describe the complete annihilation of another city-state, and Polybius did the same when he described in his histories a treaty between Rome and Carthage that ordered the latter to evacuate the whole of Sicily. The medieval crusades epitomized the use of war for domination and religious imperialism. Wars for expansion and domination were the order of business for European colonialism and territorial changes to war were common in Europe itself up until the post-World War II era. Peace agreements anchored military achievements and redistributed land, rights, and titles, allowing the victors to enjoy the spoils of war with very little care for the interest of the vanquished. Modern efforts to regulate the resort to force sought to make peace and stability the paramount goals of the international system. The UN Charter, which set out to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, allowed the use of force only under collective action by the Security Council or in our circumstances of defense of self or others. It further codified the principles of territorial integrity, non-intervention, and sovereign equality so that no war could bring about change in boundary, title, or rights. Bill Maher's mock complaint, next time you fight a war for oil, get some oil, reminds us that victors today can no longer enjoy the traditional spoils of war. Land, oil, or access to trade routes all belong to the people who inhabit the territory in conflict. The most a state can win for itself is security, the elimination of threat from others. But the human rights revolution invited states in effect, mostly liberal democracies, to win security not only for themselves, but also for those whose rights were systematically violated. In 1999, without prior authorization by the Security Council, NATO countries embarked on a 78-day campaign of aerial bombings of Serbia to save Kosovars from the iron fist of Milosevic. Human rights thus became a check on war, but also a legitimate cause for war. Human rights became a legitimate cause even for wars of self-interest. In a world of non-state actors and unconventional weapons, so held the American government, defense could no longer mean simply repelling an armed attack once it had occurred and returning to a pre-existing order. In 
nor could it rely on deterrence and bargaining. Rather, the conditions that made the attacks possible in the first place had to be changed. What was required was a comprehensive overhaul of the domestic structures of the territorial states from which these attacks originated. Democracy, human rights, and economic development thus became synonymous with security for America. As former National Security Advisor Steve Hadley put it, the US fight against Al-Qaeda was intended to offer the Muslim world a positive alternative to violent extremism. Now, transformative occupation is legally dubious. Because occupation was meant to be only temporary, the law of belligerent occupation prohibited the occupier from undertaking major changes to the occupied territory and ordered it to govern the land as it was before. The Marshall Plan, which replaced the earlier punitive Morgenthau Plan, was of course a deviation from this law, a sui generis that was recognized as such under the UN Charter. Driven by self-interested altruism, the transformative occupation of both Japan and Germany delivered democracy, prosperity, and human rights, the fault lines separating the West from the East. East Berliners had to be prevented by machine guns from fleeing to the West. No one had to watch over the West Berliners. In a 1959 movie classic, The Mouse That Roared, Peter Sellers plays the leader of a small impoverished European country who decides to invade New York City in the hope of losing the war and winning reconstruction by America. Things begin to go south when he inadvertently wins. And by the time the US invaded Iraq, the expectation of reconstruction by occupation, whatever its legality, was no longer satirical. Colin Powell warned President Bush of the Pottery Barn Rule. You break it, you own it. And owning Iraq meant, as Noah Feldman argued, long-term care for the population, including the rebuilding of infrastructure, stabilizing interfactional tension, and ensuring the protection of human rights throughout the country. In this spirit, coalition forces went so far as to implement a broad range of changes to the Iraqi legal system, even before an Iraqi interim government emerged. In Afghanistan, too, the parties to the United Nations 2001 Bonn Agreement determined the conditions for peace and established a reconstruction plan for the country, which included democratic government, protection of human rights, and long-term development. The promise of democracy and human rights was at once a self-interested ideological framework and a political justification, the means for rallying support for the war and the currency one paid for invasion. And since the promise of human rights and democracy was defined as the goal of the war, they also became a measure of what victory needed to look like. To win, the US had to prove that life in Afghanistan and Iraq was now much better than before. As the last American combat forces left Iraq, television cameras captured the exultation of a soldier finally heading home. We won, he yelled. It's over. America, we brought democracy to Iraq. Consequence number two, victory over whom or the individualization of warfare. Traditional wars were fought between armies, and once the enemy force was defeated, the enemy state capitulated and victory was declared. Modern wars are no longer fought against states. Instead, we find known and identifiable individuals. This is partly a strategic development, partly a normative commitment. On the strategy side, recent decades have seen the rise of non-state actors, terrorists, insurgents, criminal networks, even corporations, as a significant force to be reckoned with. New technologies have made weapons cheaper, more readily available, and more destructive for all actors, states and non-states alike. This created a so-called democracy of violence. And as non-state actors became stronger, states became weaker. Of 194 countries, 35 appear on the US Fund for Peace Index of Failed or Fragile States on high alert. In others, the central government has no particular interest in preventing domestic actors from projecting violence externally. And this allows individuals and networks to act with greater autonomy in exporting violence. Globalization and interdependence have increased our vulnerability, making targets all over the world more accessible to threats from anywhere and by anyone. Overall, individuals and groups have taken their position alongside states, 
as actors capable of inflicting armed attacks in a magnitude previously reserved for states alone. Moreover, states generally can be bargained with or deterred from future violence. One can reach a stable point in which an enemy state no longer poses an imminent threat. But non-state actors are far less susceptible to either negotiation or deterrence, nor are they unitary actors. Who represents Al-Qaeda today? And what happens when disgruntled Hamas members join the Islamic Jihad? Or when the IRA opts for a conciliatory process which the real IRA refuses to accept? But strategy alone does not fully account for why our model of combat is now more nuanced than ever before. It does not tell us why, unlike in antiquity, we do not hold states accountable for any violence emanating from their territory, including when waged by individuals acting without authorization from the ruler. Nor does it tell us why we do not feel free to associate governments with their states and people. The human rights revolution that emphasized individual autonomy is an important engine of this process. The fate of the individual is determined not by his association with any particular nation, but by his own individual conduct. Moreover, if the earlier state had a unified structure of government, territory, and people, liberal democracies must now take care to distinguish between rogue regimes and the innocent population. It is Saddam Hussein who is the enemy, not the Iraqi people. Milosevic, not the Serbian people. Gaddafi, not the people of Libya. And so it is not just in wars against non-state actors or terrorists, but in any future conflict with the state, like Iran, or any humanitarian intervention, as in Syria, victory would still have to be formulated and achieved with a finer distinction vis-a-vis -vis different groups. We no longer win wars against states, but only against regimes, leaders, or individual terrorists. It is the war in Iraq, not against Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, not against Afghanistan, for Kosovo, not against Serbia. And President Obama has abandoned the war on terrorism term in exchange for a war on Al-Qaeda and its associated forces. Number three, achieving victory or the policing model of war. The individualization of war breeds a response in kind. That is a military action that resembles policing more than combat. The practice of targeted killings, for example, is often criticized as extrajudicial execution precisely because it resembles the policing action and therefore refers us back to the world of law enforcement. Seen from that, seen from that angle, the targeting of a known person with a name and a face for his own particular threat or guilt is an act of an all-powerful state executing the vulnerable individual who has no way of defending himself or proving his innocence. Technology has been both the cause and an effect of the policing model. Advanced militaries have invested in developing non-lethal weapons and more precise intelligence gathering and targeting capabilities. And once these capabilities exist, humanitarian norms lead some to demand for precise targeting with zero collateral damage, and to public outcry when precise targeting goes wrong. Just as we expect the police on the streets of Boston to disable only the criminal, we want our military to kill or capture only the enemy combatant and to spare any bystanders. Expectation for careful policing ethics are especially pronounced where wars are conducted against non-state actors amidst the civilian population, one that has mixed allegiances and preferences with regard to insurgent forces. The American counterinsurgency doctrine, or COIN, now holds that fighting forces must assume greater constraints than those stipulated by the laws of war so as to minimize civilian casualties. Force protection, COIN mandates, must recede in the face of protecting Afghan or Iraqi civilians. If the 1956 U.S. Army Field Manual referred to the treatment of, quote, enemy civilians, COIN dropped the term enemy. There are no longer enemy civilians. There are only the generic, universal civilians, all of whom are worthy of our protection and care. COIN is a self-interested strategy designed to promote the war over hearts and minds. Whether or not it is ultimately effective in winning hearts and minds is almost irrelevant, as public perception of what legitimate fighting looks like would not tolerate anything else except in the case of a catastrophic threat. Now, this is not to say that fire is always precise, 
or that there are zero civilian casualties. Far from it. It is only to say that civilian casualties require explanation and apology and come at a great cost to the attacker. This is the lesson that Israel learned when it targeted Salah Shkade, the head of the military wing of Hamas in Gaza, in an operation that left 15 civilians dead alongside Shkade himself. The public uproar, both domestic and international, made sure that future targeted killings operation would take greater care to avoid civilian casualties, even at the cost of losing significant military advantage. Less than a year later, Israel had the opportunity to target the entire upper echelon of Hamas, the Hamas Dream Team, who congregated in a house in Gaza. Burnt by the lessons of the Shkade incident, the Israeli Air Force opted for a much smaller bomb. The Dream Team escaped unscathed. Now, allowing some criminals to escape is the lot of a police force, whom we constrain so as to maintain as many of our civil rights as possible. In a police world, we assume an ongoing threat over which there is no ultimate victory, only a series of contained periodic successes. This is the new battlefield. And today, the enemy combatant, like the criminal, enjoys some rights and protections. In antiquity, the person who dared take up arms without being authorized to do so by the highest authority was a barbarian a pirate, an enemy of humankind, left at the mercy of those who captured him. Under existing law, however, no combatant is to be left without rights and protections. All enemies are human beings. All deserve humane treatment. American, British, and Australian leaders all described the Abu Ghraib scandal as the lowest point in their career, as well as a major blow for coalition forces fighting in Iraq. The human rights and humanitarian revolution shape not only what is permitted in war, but also what is demanded in war. The policing model of war is thus not limited to coercive action alone, but extends to something like rehabilitation in the form of affirmative duties. This was especially evident in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Both campaigns integrated a modern Marshall Plan. But while the Marshall Plan was introduced after, after the end of military hostilities and faced little armed resistance, the process of change in Iraq and Afghanistan was both the goals and means of war, that war over hearts and minds. Now, wars over hearts and minds are a little bit like a capitalist market, where different actors offer competing ideologies and vie for popular support. In such conflicts, firepower can only be part of the strategy. For liberal democracies who offer freedom and human rights, using violence is paradoxical. Sympathy instead is solicited through benevolence. A complex strategy thus requires a greater differentiation among subjects and a mixture of aggression and beneficence that is carefully tailored to each group. Targeted killings and building hospitals are both tactics of modern warfare. The Obama administration thus included in its metrics for success in Afghanistan the level of militant-initiated violence, percent of population living in areas under insurgent control, and Afghanistan econo Afghanistan's economic stability and development with emphasis on agriculture. And in 2009, the Center for Strategic and International Studies set out to define the objective in Iraq as including effective governance, economic security and development, something approaching a rule of law, revitalizing Iraq's petroleum sector, and creating patterns of investment that can both develop the country and help unify it. Neither nation building nor affirmative duties in conflict are limited to Afghanistan or Iraq. Already some international law and international relations theorists argue that there is an emerging norm of post-conflict nation building that enjoys a legal status beyond self-interest or expediency, as well as a duty for humanitarian assistance to civilians in conflict areas. The logic of both duties is valid even when there are no boots on the ground, but wherever devastation is brought about by military action. The affirmative duties that are part of a policing model mean, in effect, that victory must be shared by all those who are committed to a better world with greater rights and freedoms. The losers, in theory, should be only those who stand in the way of progress and prosperity. In some form, all wars are now fought over hearts and minds. Number four, the unintended consequences of the fog of victory, 
It is a pretty open secret that the project of human rights and humanitarian norms has at its heart the aspiration of eliminating wars altogether. Once it is codified in international law that the life and welfare of all individuals are sacred, it becomes the function of law to place as many limitations as it can on the means and methods of warfare. The unintended result has been a greater aversion to some wars, even when they are just, and the conduct of some other wars in secret. That war is an inherent evil is self-evident, though we should keep saying it from time to time. But as human rights and humanitarian activists themselves recognize, it is sometimes the only available means for the protection of human rights themselves. The increasingly high bar for what victory must look like and for how it can be attained might deter liberal democracies from using force even when it is justified and warranted. The first casualty of war aversion is humanitarian interventions as intervening powers must consider not only risking their own combatants and expanding their own resources, but also protecting local nationals as if they were their own citizens. Recently, a group of Libyan rebels who were harmed by NATO-friendly fire announced that they expect compensation from NATO. A Libyan rebel commander was quoted as saying, we are not questioning the intentions of NATO because they are here to help us and protect our civilians. Mistakes do happen, those who make the mistakes should admit them and compensate for them. There is no indication that NATO is about to offer such compensation, and yet the mere claim by rebels who are neither citizens of NATO countries nor the victims of any apparent war crime, only beneficiaries of NATO's efforts, signifies the normative change that has occurred in placing human rights in the plight of individuals, in this case individual combatants, front and center in wartime regulation. Making human rights a public good immediately means that neither the waging of war nor conduct within it is a bilateral issue limited to the parties at war. The entire international community has now been ordered to have an interest and a say in what goes on in any particular conflict. In effect, it owns the conflict. Having more parties with a say constitutes a valuable check on states' behavior. But as any negotiation student knows, it also makes choices and negotiated agreements that much harder to conclude. The particular concerns, sincere or pernicious, of each and every country need to be factored in. And so what type of government Iraq or Afghanistan will have, what arrangements are right for Libya, how Iran's nuclear program is to be dealt with, whether intervention in Syria should be carried out, in other words, how victory is to be achieved and what it could constitute are all subjects to, and sometimes hostage to, multinational actors. International scrutiny invites the evasion of scrutiny. And so instead of fighting wars out in the open, we do it in secret. We all have educated guesses about who was behind Stuxnet or the mysterious deaths of Iranian nuclear scientists and the sabotage operation in Iranian nuclear facilities. But no country has assumed responsibility for any of these. Numerous media outlets report on the CIA drone program, but the US government has never acknowledged the program publicly. Training and weapons reached the Libyan rebels sometimes before the Security Council authorized military action. And some reports suggest that the US is supporting Arab efforts to arm the Syrian opposition as well. Unlike in the 1980s, where Congress publicly appropriated funds to support some of the Contras activities in Nicaragua, there has been no congressional approval for US support missions in either Libya or Syria. Unmanned systems, aerial, surface, and maritime, are developing with incredible speed, allowing strikes from great distances. 45 countries now have a version of them. Miniaturized, insect-sized drones and nanobots that will become operational within less than a decade will allow targeting with very low signature by the attacker. The combination of technology and concern about scrutiny will thus drive more countries to engage in more activities that are clandestine, unacknowledged, and officially unattributable to them. If we don't admit to being at war, we don't have to consider the position of others regarding how we should be fighting it or winning it. Number five, victory in the laws of war. 
In the complex environment of modern victory, there has been a complete reshuffling of the traditional division of military labor, not only on our enemy's part, but on ours as well. In Afghanistan, the US Army Corps of Engineers is building bridges and roads, while Blackwater, or as it is currently known, Z, provides perimeter security. The military is relying not only on private military companies, but also on NGOs and civilian experts. The Human Terrain System is a US Army program employing professionals from anthropology, sociology, political science, regional studies, even linguistics, to give military commanders and staff, staff a better understanding of the local population. The goal is to offer commanders an insight into the population in order to enhance operational effectiveness and reduce military civilian friction. Blurring the military and civilian categories has considerable effects on doctrines of the laws of war. The existing legal categories of civilian and combatants, nationals and aliens, all at the heart of traditional IHL, capture too much and too little as applied to the modern battlefield. They are not refined enough to include all those who are threatening to us and are too permissive in what they do allow. Consider the principle of distinction, which allows the targeting of all combatants, but orders the sparing of all civilians. In today's wars, who is a combatant and who is a civilian? Who poses a greater threat? Is a 19-year-old conscripted Iraqi military cook a legitimate target? Is the Iranian nuclear scientist a protected civilian? How about the cleric who incites to violence, or the deputy prime minister? Whose capture or killing promotes victory? Or consider the principle of proportionality, which permits the military to inflict collateral harm on civilians if such harm is not excessive in relation to the military advan advantage gained from the attack. Should the building of a girls' school in Kandahar, a present component of victory, be considered a military advantage? How about free elections in Baghdad? And if they are, how many lives are they worth? Once we make human rights both a means and an end of victory, the traditional categories that focus very much on combat and combatants cease to be instructive in wars that no longer take place between armies and that are no longer confined to the battlefield. While jettisoning traditional categories is dangerous because it invites abuse and self-serving judgments, class-based doctrines like the civilian combatant are hard to reconcile with the notion of individual autonomy. Finally, number six, the fog of victory and the war over narrative, or be careful what you promise. Mankind has always thought it important to ground victory in justice, or at least in a code of ethics. And some wars are indeed just. The American Civil War was fought for two laudable reasons, keeping the Union and the abolition of slavery. World War II was fought for national survival and the survival of humanity. Rwanda, the biggest genocide since the Holocaust, was a necessary intervention that failed to happen. It is hard to imagine something quite so clear that can be won within a convoluted world of interest I've described above. Claiming oneself to be good enough for victory, for overpowering another, must mean foregoing the ideal of universal and equal human beings. When enmity is broken down to hundreds and thousands of participants and state structures are porous and fragile, the line between right and wrong are far too fine for the blunt instrument of warfare. But for a catastrophic event or a true threat of weapons of mass destruction, it is getting harder and harder to feel justified in going to war. Did we win? Asked New York Times' Peter Baker, who was covering the final withdrawal from Iraq. Seven years later, after all the spilled blood, after all the roadside bombs and sectarian strife, after all the terror and torment, did the United States actually win the war in Iraq? It is no accident that the metrics of success in both Iraq and Afghanistan have been revised and rewritten many times over, and none was short. They included gains for us, gains for the local population, harms to our enemies, all of which also interacted with one another. 
The fog of victory grows from the difficulty in calculating the aggregate gains and losses, especially over the long run. With the practice of formal surrenders gone, and no victory parades, victory is very much in the eyes of the beholder. And from Homer to Twitter, winning wars is as much about winning the narrative of war as, or perhaps more than, a piece of conquered land. The first time I went to Cairo, I was surprised to see the 6th of October War Museum. I wondered why the Egyptians should dedicate a museum to a defeat. It turned out that the Egyptians believed they won the 6th of October War, whereas in Israeli schools we were taught that we won the Yom Kippur War. Now, a good historian must accept that both versions are both true and false, and that narrative itself ends up being another kind of victory. Narrative outlasts us, it outlasts victory itself, and referring back to a tradition of heroism and glory, it is what drives the will to power. The importance of winning the narrative war was not lost on recent American presidents. In 2005, at the advice of Peter D. Fever, a Duke University political scientist acting as a special advisor to the president, President Bush began invoking the language of success and victory more often in his speeches. Fever's research on casualty aversion suggested that Americans would support a war with mounting soldier casualties if they believed it would ultimately succeed. The president was thus pressed to convince the public that it would. President Obama conversely told ABC News that he was always worried about using the term victory because, you know, it invokes this notion of Emperor Hirohito coming down and signing a surrender to MacArthur. Obama's hesitation to promise victory stemmed from the realization that the promise must correspond to what we are able to deliver. In contrast, consider President Bush's announcement that our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. If that is the end of war, we are no more likely to see it than we are to see the end of the war on crime, on drugs, or on poverty. When wars are, were fought over land, oil, or title, there was something finite to be won a moment of victory and defeat that brought about a lasting change. No such moment exists when we fight for democracy, human rights, or security. Our gains and losses are much more amorphous, the enemy is ubiquitous, and the war unending. There are daily victories and daily defeats. Victory with a small, not a capital V. Without a grand prize, we tend to focus on how we fight more than on why we fight. Should we or shouldn't we detain people in Guantanamo Bay without trial? Should we or mustn't we torture? Is a surge the right strategy? Must the president consult with Congress before authorizing intervention in Libya? As a responsible citizenry, however, it is our duty not to drop the question why. Never to keep the goal of war far from our minds and the minds of our leaders. Imagining and reimagining what victory means and how it can be achieved focuses our morals and pragmatism to guide our actions along the way. Thank you. Okay, so questions, comments. I have one to start with. If uh, the modern war is a war for hearts and minds, is there a way of losing that war if there's not a way of winning it? There are constantly ways of losing it. Um, I think, uh, you know, we often ask ourselves, if we won, we don't ask Afghans or Iraqi enough if they think they won or we won. Um, if you plan a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue, is it only Americans who are marching or do you expect Iraqis and Afghans to march next to you? Um, I think there are constantly ways of losing uh, the war. I think uh, every, time, uh, every time there are uh, sectarian, sectarian violence erupts, 
anytime there are losers in this war for hearts and minds, um, yes, we're losing constantly. With every civilian casualty, every time a U.S. officer uh, shoots 16 or 17 civilians and is quickly taken back to the United States, we don't allow the Afghans to, to try him, we take him back. I completely understand why we do this, but that's hardly useful in a war over hearts and minds. In the end, if you define victory so broadly, and I think you are correct, that that's where we are, is it broad that we cannot accomplish the liberal peace agenda, or is it just a wan hope? And what is your own view on the kind of definition I think it's okay to hope. It's, it's, it's a good thing to hope. And it's a good thing to try and promote the values that you wish for. I think humility is also important. I think it's important to know what can or cannot be achieved, and that's, of course, context dependent. Um, I think you know one of the things that separates Europe from the United States, at least in, in some ways, is that Europeans also believe in sort of promoting democracy and human rights, although they think that doing it through engagement and positive dialogue is better than doing it by force. Of course, when they need somebody to use force, they turn to America, right? They don't do it themselves. It's always the expectation that America would do it, and maybe a few Polish soldiers will uh, kind of come along. Um, whether or not it can be achieved, I think, one of the very big problems that I think one of the, the Pinker doesn't sufficiently consider in this book is exactly the non-state actors point. Um, and I think the, the problem is not that, even if it's right that the incidence of violence overall is declining, the ability of a particular individual or a small group of individuals today to um, uh, wreak havoc and real destruction is enormous. Um, now, the only check against that, if at all, is effective states. So I think we should be doing more on the positive side, on the positive side, in helping failed or fragile states. We only do it when we sort of have an immediate interest, like Afghanistan or Iraq. So we'll engage in targeted bombings in Somalia, in targeted killings in Somalia. What about, you know, helping fragile or failed states to become stronger. I think that is a real strategy for uh, against the threat of non-state actors. Thank you. Uh, so I wonder how much this new conception of war is the product of the fact that there is much of a single dominant superpower that's a liberal democracy with a robust free press. And if the balance of power changes, can you see the old types of war emerging fights for territory? Uh, something along the old definition. Could you see a war over the reunification of China, the reunification of Korea? Is 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 the old war gone? Is it the function of a passing moment in history? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so a lot of this talk is about the wars that the United States is conducting, and isn't necessarily true for wars elsewhere. I do think we managed to make some a, a changes in the sense of what is anchored and what is not anchored. Uh, for instance, the idea of not intervening in other places, that's the Chinese and the Russian framework. That's why they um, oppose largely the Libyan intervention. They oppose uh, now Syria intervention. Um, you know, whatever they're going to do in the future, uh, they are going to have to be articulated in a, the existing legal frameworks or change them unilaterally as we've done. Yes, so law and power and morality have always been intertwined. I think the, at least the language of human rights is so embedded right now in 
culture, and not just American culture, not just Western culture. It is a language that is used everywhere around the world. You see the Syrian opposition, they're invoking a similar language. Tunisia, they're invoking a, a similar language. Uh, Chinese dissidents are talking about freedom of speech and human rights. I think it would be very, very hard to go back on it. Now, can you frame your interests in rights language to make it sound good? Yes, absolutely. But I think the language of rights is going to accompany a lot of the things that you're going to uh, see in the future. I would join others, just a superb talk. If you, if you look at the issue of Syria now and, and the Security Council is bifurcated in terms of whether it provides support or not, how, how should we think about victory in the case of Syria and other scenarios that we can imagine emerging in the not distant future? Okay, you can you repeat the question because I'm not sure oh, I can. So, so what would victory in Syria look like today if we go in? So I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. What I, uh, my, call is to have that conversation. So instead of having the conversation about what is it exactly that the Security Council authorized or didn't authorize, should President Obama go to Congress and get a uh, war power resolution uh, before or after, or should we provide support to the rebels or only do it through um, Arab countries who want to do it? And you know, how do we manage the tension with Russia? over this question. All of these questions are very good, but we need to start from a far earlier one, right? What is it that you can hope to achieve? Who are the actors? What is the, what is the day, the following day look like? And it's a problem exactly because what Tony asked, it's a problem because you sort of stand there as the world superpower and promise human rights and promise security and promise to fight for people. And you see this war going on and it has all the elements that would justify kind of a responsibility to protect a paradigm, and you're not doing anything about it. And it is a very, very difficult conundrum. Now, I don't have, I, I'm not privy to the intelligence reports coming out of Syria. I don't know, you know who the opposition is exactly, what can emerge there uh, the next day. Uh, I can ask you a question, do you think Libya was a victory? So you got deposed Gaddafi, you have a civil war going on, or the, the, some, some measure of, of civil war, is that a victory? And again, that depends if your purpose was to eliminate Gaddafi. The answer is yes. If, you, you're, if the victory was articulated in terms of uh, will protect civilians from Gaddafi, again, the answer is yes, because you're protecting them from Gaddafi. If the question is, is Libya a, pr a prospering a democracy with human rights and stable government, the answer is no. So this was a, a very provocative and interesting. Um, let me ask you, at the, at the very end, you challenged a citizenry of a liberal democracy, let's call it the United States, uh, to not give up the question of why war and what does victory look like. So maybe one way of asking it is, what does an anti-war movement look like in a universe where war is defined as you're defined? To what extent there are strong elements in your talk that make present war, as well as in your answer um, um, to John, that make present war a natural consequence of an arc of human rights and humanitarian uh, uh, understanding of law, the individualization as well as of technology, something that's sort of systemic. But the timing is also consistent and the particular wars of the last decade is also consistent with a set of excuses for imperial American power projecting itself abroad and needing a new set of excuses with the end of the Cold War. What would someone who says this ought to be victory, it can't be like the war on poverty, look like? Is it an attack on the idea of the legitimacy of these claims to support a certain kind of, law, of, of wars? That is to say, is the story a justification for American imperialism as it is today? Or is it, I want to keep the power to be able to intervene in Syria. He's killing thousands of people. So I'm not sure I got your question entirely, but here's it. Sure. 
<laughs> Look, I think that was the kind of genius part about saying you're going to bring to Afghanistan democracy and human rights, right? Because who can stand and say, I don't think democracy and human rights are a good idea. We shouldn't do it, right? The, the debate has to be about the connection between the goals and the means. So you can say, I can agree on the goals of promoting democracy and human rights in Syria, in Libya, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. I agree with the goal of winning more security and safety for the United States. The question is how? What's a good way of doing it? Okay? So is, first of all, is unmasking the question, what is the goal, right? So Bill Maher says the goal is oil. Uh, the administration told us the goal was a weapons of mass destruction, right? We didn't get oil and there weren't weapons of mass destruction. You know, were there other goals? And if so, do you need to use uh, war to, to get them? Now, the tricky part, I think, is not so much Afghanistan and Iraq. Those are kind of concluded on their own terms politically. I think the war on terrorism is a big issue. I think that is the big question, sort of the, the targeted killings and the, the continued detention, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I am totally happy to disable people who are an immediate threat. I just think there is something about the practice that it's become a habit. I'm not sure how much you know, thought goes into the, the strategic thought. Where are we investing our power? Where are we investing our resources? Are we doing it in the right place? Are we facing the right threats, right? Are we doing it in the right way? And I think that you see a lot of debate, a lot of discussion of the means, a lot of questions, you know, can we, can we do it in Somalia? Can we do it in Yemen? Is it lawful? Do you need some judicial review? Do you need some review process? A laulaki, an American citizen, a non-American citizen. What about, you know, is it really necessary now? Is it really useful? Uh, I'd love to hear from a student, but in order, we have Phil Hyman, Bob Anukin. Okay, back here we have some students, and Dick Fallon. So let's start with a student, yes. Well, uh, on behalf of your students, I will say congratulations. <laughs> um, uh, we, are, we are always uh, quite interested and exciting to listen to you. When we came here, it wasn't lawful for the American soldiers to kill Americans. But it seems like the modern warfare is not only changing the laws of armed conflict, but it's also changing the U.S. domestic law and the way we understand uh, the relationship between the U.S. constitutional law and the international law. So um, in the case of Aulaki, and, and of course it is now lawful in a way for the legal limbo for, for U.S. to kill its own citizens. So, um, and, and most of these decisions are usually political decisions. So what dynamics do you see uh, happening to local politics and changes do you see happening to the uh, US constitutional law? For many of us that are not US citizens, uh, we really admire the system here, but when you uh, listen to what is happening, it is now lawful to kill, target and kill a US citizen without a court warrant or a decision that is taken in an untransparent uh, uh, way. Uh, that is really quite disturbing. So I just want to hear your take on that. And one other thing that I briefly comment and I will mention is you always talk about uh, uh, technology and how that is really changing uh, uh, the nature of uh, uh, lawfare. There is this asymmetry between the countries that are technologically advanced and the countries that are really cannot afford those technologies. And it seems like it is unfair to continue to use the same rule or allow the same people to define the rules when to suit their own uh, uh, power and to suit their own technological advancement. So if you can say something to that, I will also be interested. So it's always tricky when you talk about changes to talk about how much is new and how much isn't new. So it's not new that America killed or captured US citizens who were at war with it. Um, there were certainly, not to mention the Civil War, but, but there were American soldiers fighting among German forces, um, and they were killed and they were captured, and that was authorized. There was no question with that. So being an enemy is more determinative, at least on the war paradigm, than being a national. And the same is true for technological superiority. There is a reason why the laws of war were written in a particular way. And yes, they are a reflection of certain power structures. And not all countries have the same access to air power, and not all combatants had access to the catapult or the, the a crossbow. In fact, 
you know, there is a lateral a Lat Lateran Council order from the 12th century that banned the use of crossbow exactly because it allowed peasants to shoot at um, at the knights, and the knights didn't want that. The nobility didn't want to be uh, so that so they prohibited that weapon. It's all about asymmetry of of power, right? That's always the story, and that's the story for politics, and that's the story for law. Those who are more powerful make the law. As I tell my students, it always, it's always better to be rich, powerful, and healthy than not. So that's the first lesson. Um, as for what is happening within the United States, so Jack's new book, uh, Power and Constraint, uh, right? That's Power, power and Constraint. Um, uh, it's a great book, and it talks about a whether troublingly or not, the emerging consensus in uh, American, uh, in the American politics and, and apparatuses, the political echelons of a agreement around the practices that have emerged since 9-11. He says through an iterated process of involving Congress, involving the courts, media, uh, internal checks and balances in, in various guys, you, you've reached a, a kind of a status quo of legal matters on how to deal with Americans, how to deal with foreigners, et cetera, et cetera. What troubles me is that it's in some ways a too convenient status quo, that no one has an incentive to um, to move from. So it's very hard to prove a negative. It's very hard to explain why we haven't seen more attacks, right? And for a president to stand and say, I am now reducing the practice of targeted killings, okay? Not because Pakistan is angry with me or that it gets me into trouble in Yemen, but because I'm willing to take the risk because I don't think it's useful, I don't think it's effective, I'm not gaining more by this. There is no incentive for anyone to do that. And that, once you've created the, that balance that, Jack's talk, that Jack talks about, it goes back to Yochai's question, it becomes very hard to sort of rally support uh, among people to ask, is this really necessary at all? <coughs> okay, wars aren't good for furthering human rights. I mean, they, they don't seem to work very well in that regard, our recent wars. But what about creating influence? What, what happened to victory as creating supportive regimes around the world that are supportive of our interests and security? Is it, isn't that picture? First of all, some wars do bring about human rights. Now, the war in Kosovo was very good for human rights overall. Right? Yes, people died, people were killed, there was more violence, but it also brought human rights. And if we had a war and intervention in Rwanda, it would have been good for human rights, at least in a, in a, in a midterm uh, view. And no strategy can always tell you, you know, you can't, ever imagine the 16 steps of taking an action, you know, what's going to happen within five years, 10 years, or 15 years. And I think the term victory does matter here. I think proving that your way worked, that you emerge victorious from World War II, that you emerge victorious from the Cold War, helps you vindicate those, those, um, those values and those rights. The fact that it wasn't even the United States, it was the West that emerged victorious from the Cold War. It was the West over the decline of the East was a good way of promoting and projecting human rights and, and democracy. There was a reason why that was emulated by uh, subsequent, uh, all the new emerging states. It was a lot about US and European pressure, but there was a reason why all these new countries also adopted the form of democracy. Um, Again, there's, there are a lot of ways of influencing and promoting ideas. And Robert Kagan says this is the difference, again, that for the United States that has such military might, every problem seems like a nail, right? That's the military is the hammer and every problem seems like a nail. Um, again, I'm not entirely sure that's right. Uh, I also think that we choose how and where to influence based on a myriad of considerations, not all of them are about promoting human rights or stability. 
Uh, part of the anger that the Muslim world, and you know this more than anybody else, that part of the anger in the Muslim world is exactly the support of the United States for all kind of bad regimes that just happen to be stable and friendly to America and promise security to America, but were not really very nice to their own people. Um, and again, I think we, we, when we use the, the terms, when we ourselves use the cover of human rights and democracy, uh, we need to make sure that we are at least, at least appear to be consistent in our policies, even if we're not 100% there. There are many more questions, but just as we don't know exactly when victories arrive, <laughs> we don't know when the conversation is over. But we do know that it's time to do something that we haven't done yet, which is to reveal what is behind this <laughs>